The next day, Maria was at Michikoto and Sochi's home explaining all the information about the case. Even though it was only 7 a.m. in the morning, both Sochi and Michikoto were already ready to leave. Weapons packed, the van packed, and their clothes packed. While Maria was still in disarray and wearing the same clothes from the from last night when she spoke to Popsicola. So that's the information we have on the case. I wanted to get you both to agree to it before we head out. Did his check clear already? Michikoto asked Maria, who nodded in return. Yeah, already cleared. Deposited last night and cleared before midnight. Checks that large usually take a few weeks to process and have to be approved by a few people just to make sure there's nothing illegal going on. So, it seems Mr. Popsicola has quite a few friends in high places to rubber stamp it, but legally, we're clear, and the money is real, and I have no reason to think the rest of the money is fake. It is from Caligula's Carnival. The drawback is it's from Caligula's Carnival. Michikoto nodded, and so she looked like she bit into something sour. There was no surprise there. Caligula's carnival of cannibalistic carnage was an even worse place than the name suggested. People very often entered the carnival and never left. Those lucky enough to leave usually had to pay an arm and a leg to just crawl away, but a very rare few left with a fortune and enough stories to keep people going in. Even against impossible odds, hoping that they will be the next lucky one. It was like the state lottery, except all the losers were killed and robbed to fund the winnings. Even though it was dangerous, any attempts from any government to shut them down only led to the police finding an abandoned lot and a lot of skeletons. Some of the skeletons were still moving, still screaming, still killing. More than once, all three of them were called in to clear out the dead that wouldn't stay dead. So, naturally, no one in the room had a high opinion of Caligula's carnival. But on the other plate of the scale, as dangerous as the carnival was, the plutocrats were known for being honest in their dealings, if not a bit mischievous when it was time to pay. And the reason why Pius was comfortable even approaching Maria the night before was because of a treaty made by the Hunter's Guild in the old days. Caligula's carnival of cannibalistic carnage would always ask the Hunter's Guild for help in finding dangerous attractions that escaped. And in exchange, Caligula's carnival would keep the dangerous creatures that the Hunters could not kill as attractions. While there were also subtle details in the treaty, such as Hunters could not harm a single representative of Caligula, and the carnival was not allowed to serve the hunters. An important part of the Treaty of Copper was that Caligula would seek out help from the Hunters Guild. So the plutocrat was likely to obey the treaty simply because it benefited him more and cost him less to simply follow along. Do you think there's anything about this that feels weird? Sochi asked Maria. She thought for a moment and shook her head. No weirder than normal. The only thing I want to check when we get there is if the fortune teller is actually sapient or not. If he is, we need to try to get rid of his curse. Treaty or not, I don't want any cold blood on my hands," Maria said, lifting her hands up and looking at her fingers. They were clean and only lightly calloused. She had to do many things throughout her years to earn every single callous. But the work of keeping her hands clean was much harder than the work that made the calluses. We'll keep ourselves clean, but I agree with this mission. What about you, Mitch? Sochi asked her husband, who thought deep for a moment before he asked his next question. Do you think the fortune teller can bleed? He asked Maria. As ominous the question seemed, it did serve a tactical purpose. His weapons used obsidian bolts that were greatly enhanced in durability with the ability to pierce even the toughest of flesh. But every bolt fired would have to draw blood, either his enemies or his own. Maria 
remembered not long ago how her cousin nearly bled to death when he missed his shot at a sufferer. I believe he bleeds. The picture indicates that despite the metal helm, he's still mostly biological. Probably biologically immortal, but honestly, has that stopped you before? Maria asked, lightly slugging Michikotl's so shoulder, who smiled in response. More than one creature had claimed to be immortal, or unkillable, or invulnerable, and all of them had bled by Michikotl's bolt. Well, I guess that means I'm in also. Time to pack up the van, Michikotl said, which drew a long sigh from Maria. Despite everything in the van, there was still more to pack in, and packing up the van was always the least favorite part of any mission to her. It was boring, tedious, repetitive, and no matter what she did, she always forgot something that wasn't important while she was packing, but important during the mission. After a few hours, the van was fully packed up, and Maria went over the list of all the equipment. Weapons, rope, tents, knives, hatchets, solar charger, satellite smartphone, food, water, spare batteries, fire starter equipment, journals, and pens. She went over the list three times and even checked with Michikotl and Sochi. They couldn't find anything missing. So, finally ready, the three of them drove off to the northern forest. It would take a few hours to get to the destination, but Maria was confident they would make it to the northern forest with no issues, as she fell asleep in the back seat for a nap. The next time she woke up, the sun was starting to set, and Michikotl was shaking her shoulder, while Sochi was inside the gas station yelling at the cashier. Hey, um question. Where are the gas cans? Michikotl asked while she yawned and stretched while going through her mental list. She didn't remember to pack the gas cans. I think back home, she said, keeping her eyes closed in frustration. She heard Michikotl let out a long sigh before speaking. Well, I wish I knew that a hundred kilometers ago. This is the last gas station before we go to the valley, and there isn't enough room for the trip back in the van's tanks. I'll go ask if the cashier has any for sale. More screaming and yelling could be heard inside of the gas station, while Michikoto let out a sigh of a different tone. <sighs> before Sochi blows the roof off the gas station, he said before leaving and heading into the gas station to calm Sochi down. Sochi was a good person. One of the kindest people Maria ever met. But she also had an unfortunate habit of absorbing emotions from those around her. This made her empathetic and a good diplomat. But sometimes it also led to situations like these where she escalated and just kept escalating. Until things became destructive. But fortunately Michikoto could always calm her down. Maria watched as Michikotl spoke with the cashier while Sochi stomped out to the car and sat down, being completely silent, staring at the windshield. After leaving her alone for a minute, Maria reached up. So, you doing okay? Maria asked, reaching forward to grab Sochi's shoulder, who let out a sigh while staring out the windshield. No, the cashier was a jack hat. He was asleep when I went in and when I tried buying the gas canister, he got upset for me for disturbing his nap. He actually started complaining about how he was bored all the time. And only when he was napping or watching a video did someone come in. So Chi's fingers were straight and held to the side of her head while she pressed her hands against her head, trying to keep the frustration from overwhelming her. I tried to just listen and apologize. Normally, I would have just left, but we need the gas canisters. And he just kept complaining. Even when I asked to just pay for the canister, he had the audacity to complain about how people don't like to listen. And the worst part wasn't even his words, but what was in his head. He actually believes that the world exists just to make him frustrated. He kept getting frustrated and kept going on and on and on and then I just snapped. 
I told him to his face that if he wanted to get paid to sleep, he could try to get a job himself instead of being given this job by his failed father. Needless to say, I am glad Michikoto stepped in. That cashier is beyond pissed. So she finished while Maria rubbed her shoulder for a moment before she asked, Did he actually get this job because of his father? Well, yeah, his father owns the gas station. His name is on the licensing outside and the cashier's name tag is the same last name but a different first name and he was very embarrassed that I pointed it out to him that you don't need to be an empath to notice that. Sochi finished before Maria giggled. <laughs> Glad you showed him, but I'm hoping we aren't banned for life. Wow, a week-long ban. A brand new record. That comment brought a smile and laugh to the two women. They had dealt with life-ending dangers on a regular basis since they graduated college. Joking about death was part of their coping mechanisms. Michikoto was finally leaving the gas station carrying two red gas canisters while he got busy filling them up. I'll check up on him, Maria said, leaving the back seat as she went out to speak to Michikoto while Sochi started playing music on the radio to distract herself from what just happened. So, how bad is the damage? Maria asked him. Well, the good news is I got two gas canisters, but they were like 40 each. So, that's a thing. If that's the good news, do I even want to know what the bad news is? Well, Sochi has been banned from the only gas station in Craven's Creek. I didn't know this white spot in the road was a town, Maria said, looking around the gas station. There was a two-lane road, a single pump gas station with the general store inside, and across the street was a rundown shack that looked like it was condemned when the emperor's grandfather was born. The only other thing around was the towering trees that thrived in the northern forest. She was no stranger to small towns across Vespucci. She had even visited more than one town that had a population of zero, and even towns that had negative zero people, but they were still better maintained than Craven's Creek of the Northern Forest. Welcome to Craven's Creek. Our amenities include tax-free gasoline and firewood, Mitchell Kotal said sarcastically while filling up the canister, bringing a chuckle for Maria. Are you going to be okay? She asked, patting Michikotl's back. This was the first mission he took since getting injured on the Nagalfari, and there was a lot of money in that mission, but most of it was spent just getting Michikotl patched up and back to fighting shape. Being a hunter and a hero was a costly business. Most families who lost their heirlooms to a hellhound generally didn't have a lot of money to spend on getting it back. So rare missions like these that paid so well were worth it. But the risk was also great. The loss of Michikotl was something she didn't want to think about, but that was a very real possibility ever since he started the hunt. I'm doing okay. The cashier was a jack hat, but we've handled jack hats before. You know that's not what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, I'll be okay. I've healed well and Quite honestly, I need a win. On the Nagalfari, there was almost no one left. Just so much death. And I was almost just another blood stain on that boat. Michikotl said before he held his hand to his heart for a moment, like he was reassuring himself that his heartbeat was still there. When I was bleeding out, my thoughts weren't about me. They were about Sochi about how I was never going to see her again. And I could swear that I heard the laugh of Kaisen when I was in her arms. I sent so many to him, it's only a matter of time before he claims me also, Michikoto said while Maria awkwardly switched from one foot to the other. Have you talked to Sochi about these dreams? She knows about them. That doesn't answer my question. You should probably talk about the dreams you're having with her, and you know we can get you a therapist to talk about with these dreams also. 
Lots of people struggle with survivor's guilt and have a ha and have had a hard time sleeping after a near-death experience. Maria offered while Michikoto sighed, being quiet for a moment before he finally answered. Okay, I'll talk to a therapist when we get back. But you're still keeping my secret? He asked, and Maria nodded. Of course, cousin. I've not told a single soul, she reassured him. Michikoto didn't keep many secrets from Sochi, but this was one he shared with his only cousin. His weapon wasn't just enchanted to draw blood with every shot. Michikoto believed that his bolts were enchanted by Kaisen, god of death and the underworld, and that Michikoto's life will only end by his own weapon. This made him brave in many situations, but also made him incredibly anxious every time he was injured by his crossbow. Maria asked him many times to at least use non-enchanted obsidian bolts, but he insisted on using them for every hunt. He refused telling Sochi because he knew if she knew, she wouldn't let him use the crossbow anymore. And despite his beliefs, Maria didn't believe his bolts were enchanted by Kaisen. She didn't believe in any, in any god. She believed that the world was strange, complicated, and fantastical, but that it had to have some kind of rules to be followed by every being, powerful and powerless. But she still respected her cousin's belief and spirituality, and as ridiculous the explanation for why his crossbow was so powerful, she knew for certain many supposedly deathless demons had died by that crossbow. The canisters, now filled with gasoline, Maria grabbed them ready to put them in the trunk, but before she did, she whispered to Michikoto, You're going to have to tell her about your nightmares. You don't have to carry the burden alone, but if you keep holding that by yourself, we will be carrying you, not your burdens. Remember that, Maria warned Michikotl. After the gas was in the trunk, Maria slipped back into her seat while Michikotl continued his driving. As she started dozing off, she heard Michikotl whisper to Sochi, I need to tell you about my nightmares. When they arrived at the valley, the sun had already set hours ago. Maria woke up when Michikoto put the van in park. He locked the doors and whispered to Maria, We can't go out at night. The fortune teller might not be nocturnal, but we're not nocturnal either. So Maria, think you can keep watch till sunrise? Yeah, yeah, but are you going to be able to sleep? Maria asked while Michikoto yawned and unbuckled his seatbelt while he leaned his seat back. I'm sure I'll manage, he said, closing his eyes and starting to slip off to sleep. Sochi was already asleep next to him. Maria sighed and watched the outside for any movement. This did work out better for her. She was more awake at night than in day, and she did get a chance to sleep on the ride over. She was always like this, but very few jobs or classes thrived on someone more awake at night than during the day. But thankfully, Michikoto was accepting of her sleeping during the day. Feeling a shift, Marcus reached into his pocket for his rubber band and tied his long hair behind his head into a ponytail. He wished he had more space to change his clothes and to get to wear his binder, but he would still make do. This was another perk of working with his family. They were accepting of Marcus when he was a he, or when Maria was a she. Being gender fluid was a lot of things, but he found that he didn't have to explain himself to the world if he didn't want to. So he just did what made himself the most comfortable. Watching the woods through the windows, Marcus saw some of the bushes moving with the wind, but his paranoid eyes saw it as a threat. Letting himself stare for a moment, and not seeing any changes, he let his eyes relax and simply watched the woods and listened. It was a lot like growing up, constantly watching for threats and often over-examining the simplest of things. Sometimes when people were coughing, they were trying to insult you. Sometimes they were preparing to attack you. 
and sometimes it was just a cough. Sometimes bushes moved because of wild animals adjusting for the night. Sometimes bushes moved because of the weather. And sometimes bushes moved because something was in them trying to hunt you. Still though, Marcus let his heart relax, seeing no other evidence of danger. He let his anxiety chill and cool. His friends were counting on him to watch over them, and they would need rest, so he would only wake them if he was certain. And so the night went on. Marcus watched and listened, and though he was certain he heard rustles, they didn't last long enough to pinpoint, let alone identify. He heard the calls of birds and the buzz of bugs, and the rustle of the wind through the leaves. So he was certain whatever it was, it was normal. But as the first light of a gray dawn made itself known through the windshield, something happened that caused Marcus's hair on the back of his neck to rise. At first, he swept his eyes over the forest to see if it was something he saw. He was aware of it unconsciously before his conscious mind made the connection. The forest was now quiet. Throughout the entire night, the forest wasn't truly quiet, not even in the van. He could hear the sound of small animals moving and movement in the woods, and of the breeze through the trees. But now, all of a sudden, there was nothing. No birds, no bugs, no breeze, nothing. Very few predators have the power to inspire such fear among the entire animal kingdom and none have the power to quiet the wind. Shaking both Sochi and Michikotl's shoulders, Marcus whispered to them both, I think there's something outside, he whispered while they woke up quickly but quietly. Thankfully, they had an almost instinctive reaction to waking up, fully functional. I'll go first, Michikotl whispered, picking up the large knife he kept in the driver's side door. Being a hunter and being paranoid, Michikoto had a weapon within reach in all parts of the car at all times. Marcus was aware of at least four, but according to Sochi, she knew of a dozen more. When they asked Michikoto about how many weapons he had, he laughed and said they were thinking too small. Opening his door quickly and closing it, Michikoto stood outside. His knife was drawn and held professionally with the practice of one who knew how to handle it. Despite the fear Marcus felt in his heart, Mitsukoto searched without fear. Whether that was from the belief that he wasn't going to die here, or just pure courage to face whatever was outside, Marcus was unsure. Mitsukoto disappeared to the side of the van and there was silence before there was a long knock followed by two quick knocks. Michikoto signed that it was safe to come out, a signal that was worked out when both Marcus and Michikoto were children. Opening their doors, both Sochi and Marcus stepped out and saw what made the forest animals stop calling. In the clearing, not 20 meters from the van, were the remains of a bear, but it wasn't killed by any wolf nor bear that lived in these woods. No meat was taken from the bear, and the skin and the rib cage were broken apart, and the entrails were removed and left discarded on the ground, handprints and footprints left in brown blood and dust were marked on the bear's skin and led to the woods. The corpse was starting to smell, and already Marcus was trying to figure out how to bring the corpse away from the camp. but. Then Marcus noticed something else that was wrong. Despite the fact it was starting to smell and was clearly dead for a while, not a single scavenger scurried through the savaged carcass. The flesh was either poisoned or cursed by the fortune teller's touch, and now no creature would touch the flesh. So clearly, neither should they. The fortune teller left us a message last night. Marcus said, opening the trunk and removing a canister of gas as he poured it on the bear carcass, 
making sure to leave it soaked so that it would catch easier. What message is that? Sochi asked, trying not to look at the corpse. Even with the bear gone, she was probably having intrusive thoughts about how it would feel to have gasoline on her internal organs. So looking at the bear definitely would have made things a lot worse for her. The message is, I'm strong. This is my territory. Leave or you will die. This is your chance to leave. This implies sapience, or at least foresight, on the behalf of the fortune teller. That just made things a lot more complicated, Marcus said, leave, removing a book of matches from his vest's many pockets. With your blessing, Michikotl, he asked his cousin. Oh, sure, you can burn it. Michikotl responded before Marcus sighed and tried again. Mitch, I mean say your prayers while I burn the cursed carcass, Marcus said. He didn't believe in the gods, but he did notice prayer did help keep cursed items from surviving the purifying effects of fire. Oh, yeah, sure. Michikotl said as he began his prayer to his namesake, while Marcus struck a match and let it drop on the gasoline-soaked skin. It took four tries before it finally caught, and then they backed away from it, watching it burn and the black smoke twist and dissipate into the sky. As the cursed corpse carbonized, the cries and calls of the creatures of the forest started to return as it was turned to ash. Whatever the fortune teller had planned for that trap was now disrupted, at least hopefully. Still though, Marcus glanced around the trees, feeling that somewhere the fortune teller was watching, and he knew this wasn't going to be any normal hunt.